Hi, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my class on Programming in Go. I want to introduce Go's Context Package. Context was added maybe in Go 1.7 as a way of providing a common method of cancellation for work in progress. Now, context is not specifically about concurrency, but I didn't want to talk about it until I'd had a chance to introduce select because you'll see context work with select. So now I'll go ahead and talk about it. So the context package is a way to tie together a bunch of related work. Imagine for a second I've got a microservice, I get a request, and that request spawns some other requests. I need to talk to two or three other microservices and maybe do a database transaction. And I want something to tie them together. For example, if I decide to cancel, I want everything to cancel. Or maybe I want a timeout and I want the timeout to apply to all of these sub pieces at the same time. Okay, so context was originally invented primarily as a means of providing that context cancellation. In other words, tying together a bunch of work so it all gets canceled together. Now, it turns out well, there's another utility about passing values, and I'll talk about that in a second. So we have two kinds of cancellation. The first is explicit. I get some sort of cancel function that I can just call and say, hey, this context is canceled. Drop all the work related to it. More likely, I'm going to have a timeout. It's more common that way. I'll have a timeout. You know, it won't be the same as I've got HTTP socket timeouts, or maybe the database has a timeout, but I want a common timeout, right? I got a request, and I'm going to handle it within three seconds, or I'm going to drop it, regardless of how many other microservices I talk to or what their network settings are. So at the end of three seconds, either I've canceled it because I've actually completed the work. In other words, I stop the timeout from happening, or the timeout happens and I stop all the work that isn't actually completed. And that's a very useful function. So with a context, we get a couple things. The first is we get a channel. There's a function called done. If we call it, it gives us a channel that we can listen to. And if that channel becomes ready to read, then we've been signaled, right? We should stop working. And if we get that signal, then there's another function, error. And if we call that, we'll get a reason why we were told to stop working. Maybe the error is because we timed out, or maybe the error is because there was an explicit cancellation. Now, with that, we're going to see select often because we're listening to a channel. And it may be one of several channels we're listening to. And so again, the done channel is likely to show up in a select block when we use it in practice. Now, context is a little hard to understand because of one particular property it has. The context is not one thing. The context is actually a tree, usually. Okay, It has some root context that has no information. And as we add things to it, if we add a cancellation property, or we add a timeout, or we cast the con context to carry a value along with it, we keep making more nodes in this tree. And the individual nodes, once they're created, are immutable. Okay? You never modify an existing context. What you do is you actually create a new context that points to the parents above it. All right? And that becomes a tree that can be walked not from the top but from the bottom. So if I'm looking to see if it's timed out, I'm going to look up from the bottom to see the first context in this tree that has a timeout property. Now, it's very important that they be immutable because we pass context around in Go routines. And if they weren't immutable, we'd have a problem. But this immutability property is actually very nice. It does mean, though, so we have to think about trees and subtrees. If I have a context that somebody passes into me and I want to add a timeout, again, I'm going to create a new context that points at the old one. And the timeout applies downward. It applies to the context I just created, and it applies to any context that is derived from the one that I have now. Okay? In other words, any new children will point up to my context with a timeout. But the timeout will not apply to anything sort of above me. Okay? So think about it this way, and I'm going to draw you a picture here in a second. But I've got an incoming HTTP request, and I add a timeout to it, and then I start calling other outgoing requests to other microservices. Okay? My, the timeout applies to me and those other calls below me, but it doesn't apply to the HTTP request before I got it and started processing it, because the context above me doesn't have my timeout. 
Okay, the parent context may have its own thing, but it doesn't have mine. Again, so we, we don't modify a context, we add subtrees to a context. So at the top of this picture, right, I've got some root context. And the most common way to do that is to call this function context.background, which gives you basically a context that you can point to that doesn't have anything in it. Let's suppose we want to add a value, and we'll talk about values in a second, but we're going to create a context with a value that we can carry along like a trace ID that we want in all our logs. So I call the function context with value. I pass in a context, and it gives me a context back, which typically I just assign over top of the old one. But in reality, it's a new object with a pointer going upwards to the root. Okay. So unlike a lot of trees where we have a root that points down, what we actually have are children that point back up. Okay? And it has, of course, this notion of a value that's stored along, along with it. Now I want to put a timeout. So I call context with timeout. I pass in the parent context and the timeout value. And again, it gives me a new context. Now in the case of with timeout and a couple other functions, it actually gives me two things. It gives me the new context and it gives me a cancel function. And cancel, which maybe I should have spelled out, cancel, I think I do that most places, is a function that's being returned to me that I can call. And the most common thing we do is we immediately defer calling it. Okay, not always, but commonly. So let me show you how we use a context then. I'm gonna make an HTTP request. And one of my options is to take my request and actually add a context into it. So I take the context where I've added a timeout, for example, and I put it into my HTTP request before I go and do the request. And that means I pass that timeout down into Go's HTTP library, right? When time goes off, if this request isn't done, it will be canceled, right? And we don't see that. It's buried deep inside the HTTP library, but it'll happen for us, okay? So this is sort of an example of how it works. Again, it's an immutable tree structure. Once I've laid down a node like this one, right, with this timeout, it doesn't change again, all right? I can add another child under it, but I can't change that node or its parents. They're, they're fixed. So I'm gonna do an example, and I'm actually gonna to go to the laptop in just a second. But I wanna point out something about context, and that is, if we're passing it around to a function, then generally speaking, two things. One, we want to pass it as a parameter, and we want to pass it as the first parameter. Okay, that's a very common convention. It's the norm in Go. And it also usually has the name CTX, short for context. Right, so I'm in the laptop, and I want to go back to our parallel get example. And I have it here, the original version. Right, we had the original version, then we added a, a select block with a timer. We're going to do it slightly differently this time. Right? So I've, again, I've got my result type, I've got my get function, right, which does an HTTP request and returns the result on a channel. Okay, I've got my channel for results, I've got my list of URLs and so on. Right? We, again, we start some Go routines and then we wait for results. I'm going to create a context. Right? And so it doesn't have a parent, so I'm going to give it a parent. I'm just going to call context.background and get a new empty context. And I'm going to give it a timeout, right? time.second. Now, again, what I typically do, the very next thing I'm going to do is defer cancel. And I'll explain why in a second. Right? So I'm going to change my get function to take a context and then the URL and results. And that's all we need to do right here. All right, the next piece is down here. I take my get function, and I need to add the parameter. Okay. And I'm going to use that. So instead of creating the request the usual way, and I'm going to cheat. I'm going to ignore the error from calling this call because it's not likely to fail and because we just don't want to mess with that right now. All right. Instead of calling the regular new request, so there's a couple ways. I can call a new request, 
and then I can modify the request afterwards to put a context on it. But actually, there's a very nice call called new request with context. It's very convenient. All right, and so now I've got a request. Now, in the past, I've just called get with the URL, but now I'm creating a request because I want to put some more attributes on it. And so now instead, I'm going to call the default client and have it use its do method. And instead of passing the URL itself, I'm going to pass the request, which now has the URL and the context. All right. So what does that mean? Well, it means I've just injected a three-second timeout into the HTTP get. All right. So remember, um, when, when we did this last time, I added this extra local server, which has this seven-second sleep. So it's going to fail. In the past, what we did is we hit the timer in the select block, which stopped the program. What's going to happen now instead is this context passed into HTTP is going to cause the HTTP request right here to fail. We're going to get an error back from this rather than results because it's going to time out before we get a response from the server. And then it'll pass through the regular error mechanism. All right, let's give it a try. So I'm going to run it. Now, we've got a different output. So first of all, this log up here actually is the log from the server that says, oh, I'm, I got your request. I'm not going to handle it right now. And actually down here, we got another, another thing when it actually sent the response, which was sometime later. But look here, right? So I got four results, and those four results came back pretty quickly. And then I got one more result, but instead of getting a time, I got the error message. Again, what happened was we passed the context into do, and because it timed out before there was a response, we got the error, and we came down here and we printed the error. So what is the error? Context deadline exceeded. Now, we're going there's two calls we could have done. There's context with timeout and context with deadline. The difference is, with timeout, you say a duration, like three seconds, and with deadline, you say like a wall clock time, stop at five o'clock. Okay? It doesn't really matter. Internally, it gets turned into one thing. But that's the message you get, context deadline exceeded. So this HTTP get up here, right? HTTP was watching for that context to time out and returned an error when it did. And this is actually better. This is a lot cleaner than creating the select and the timer in the main program. So I'm going to switch here now to another window. So let me clear my console, and we're going to switch to a different program. And I've got a piece of it here already. It's actually parallel get another version. So I've still got my result, and we'll come back in a second and talk about what's going on there. Right? I'm going to start my main program, hand out a bunch of URLs, and I'm going to call a function whose job is give me the first response. Okay. Now, imagine you had a case where, for redundancy, your microservice, instead of calling one other microservice to do something, it calls two or three, and whichever one responds first, that one wins. Right? And that's what we're going to do. So first is going to give us the first response, and of course we'll need to do with the others. Right? And we'll get that first response and print it out. And then there's a little more stuff going on down here because the program the first time around isn't going to work quite right. So I want to go talk about what happens in first before I do any more. All right. And in first, we take a context and we take a list of URLs and we're going to return a result. Now, right, we're going to use get and get is still going to return something on a channel. So We've got a results channel, but we're going to need a context, all right? And this time we're going to call context dot with cancel. We want to add cancellation to whatever context was given to us, okay? And we're going to defer again, cancel, okay? Now, what I didn't mention in the last one was we did the context with timeout and then we canceled. We need to cancel, if we, even if the timeout doesn't happen, to make sure we release the resources. In this case, though, we're doing a bit more, okay? Because we're going to start multiple requests 
we're going to get one response, and then we're going to make all the other ones cancel. Right? So we again, but we need the call to cancel to make that happen, no matter what. Right? So I'm going to go ahead then and given the list of URLs, having created this context that I can cancel, I've deferred con cancel, I've started my go routines. So we're going to go and start these parallel gets, and now I need a select block. Right? And I said we would see a lot of context with select. So I need my normal case where I actually get the result. Right? And in that case, I'm just going to return it and no error. Right? So this is the case where somebody responds, I get the response, and I'm done. Right? If I return, return is going to cause me to do the deferred cancellation, which means all the other requests are going to get canceled. Now, I'm going to put another case in here that's a little unrelated. All right, I'm going to call context.done anyway. And if, I, if that happens, I'm going to return nil, and I'm going to return the error I got from the context. Now, can my cancellation cause this case to happen? And the answer is no. Right? I come into the select block. If I get a result and I return, my return is what's causing the deferred cancellation to happen. But that's happening on my context and any context below me in those HTTP requests. Okay. Why have I put this here? Because I got a context given to me from above. What if the person who sent it to me had a timeout and the timeout happens? Right? Maybe it happens before I even get the first result. So if I take a context and I have a select where I'm waiting on channels, then I'd better also handle the case of the context becoming done. Right? Again, that's the parent context being canceled above me or having a timeout above me. Right? If I didn't have a select, if all I did was pass it through to somebody else, I wouldn't worry about it because then whoever I pass it to has that responsibility. Right? If you look at the first example we did just a couple minutes ago, I passed a context to HTTP GET, and inside the HTTP mechanism is where it looked for the context to be done, right, and timed out and sent me an error back. But in this case, I've got a context and a select, so it's my responsibility to be prepared for my context being canceled above me. Right? And what I mean by that is the context that was actually passed in as the original functional parameter. Now, and you may say, well, what about this? Okay, you overwrote it. I called context with cancel. I got a new context. This is not the same context. Correct. But it is a descendant of the context that might cancel. Right? Since I clearly don't ca cancel myself, we already said that can't happen. Right? When I look for context.done, we're going to be looking for a done channel somewhere, which could be a done channel above me. Right? that I'm actually done. All right, so that's this piece. Now, if I run this, I've added a little bit more mechanism in here, right? When I run this, after I'm done printing out my result, I got the first one, I canceled the others, I'm going to wait a little bit. And the reason I'm going to wait a bit is because this program is a mistake. And it's not exactly related to context, but since I'm showing this paradigm, I want to explain the mistake. And then when I talk about channels in the next segment, I will get into it in yet more detail. All right. The mistake is the question about, well, okay, I started, excuse me, down here, I started some number of go routines. Okay. I got the first response by listening to the results channel. What about the other Go routines? I'm canceling the HTTP operation, but what happens to those Go routines? And the answer is they're going to get hung up. Right? And they're going to get hung up because I made my results channel with no buffer. Now, again, we'll talk about more about this later, but an unbuffered channel, if somebody wants to send, somebody else has to be able to receive because they happen at the same time, more or less. In other words, if there's nobody receiving, the sender blocks until somebody's ready to receive. So the first 
go routine delivers a result, and I'm down here in my select waiting for something on the results channel. I read it. And that's the last thing I ever do with that channel. The, in fact, this whole function first is going to go away. So the other Go routines that want to write to the results channel are going to get stuck. They can't write because there's nobody to read. The only possible reader just went away. And that means we're going to have leaking Go routines, which is a bug. And in a long-running server, leaking Go routines are your number one problem. I mean, there's two things really that can go wrong in a server. You leak sockets or Go routines. And typically, if you leak sockets, you end up leaking both. Right? And that's how you get a memory leak. Almost always, you get a memory leak from leaking Go routines, not really from anything else. So I want to go look at my get, because I've modified it a little bit to help to show this thing. Right? My get is now going to create a new request with context. We did that. Right? But it's also going to have a ticker. And the ticker here is just for show. Right? I'm going to do my HTTP request. I'm going to get the result. I'm not putting the result on the channel immediately. I'm going to assign it to a variable. Fine. And then I'm going to have a for loop with the select block. Right? And the select block now has a case of sending instead of receiving. And again, I said the, the, the cases in select could be ready to receive or ready to send. This is a ready to send. Okay? If R can be sent on the channel, I will do that, and I will return from this function. And when I return from get, that's the end of my Go routine. It's done. Okay? But if I can't, if I block on that because, I'm sorry, block on that line because nobody's ready to receive, then I'll likely end up hitting this ticker. It'll go tick, tick, tick. So let's run this thing and see what happens. All right. And yes, we are, we are ticking away. It's going to stop here in a second. Okay. Now I want to, I want to go up and just look at only the results for a second, and then we'll go back to the program. Now this first log line again, that's coming from this other server out there that was waiting for a response. And down here later we see after several seconds it did respond. Okay. We got the first response, in this case Google 1. And that's not to say anything special about Google. You know, vagaries of network latency. In this case, Google just happened to respond first. So we got that response. And the Go routine that was doing the Google query, it went away. Right? Now if I look at the rest of these, right, I'm going to see these same names over and over again. Right? I've got four other Go routines, and every second they're ticking away. Right? And they're going to tick away until I get tired of it, and I just go ahead and say, you know what, stop. All right? So let me go back to the program. Right? The stop part was, you know, I got down here, I slept for nine seconds, and then I decided to quit. And when I quit, I print out how many Go routines are still active. Twelve. Okay? Now it turns out that, you know, besides the Go routine I created, there may be one or more behind the scenes running those sockets. Fine. Now it's not a problem. Again, we can have tens of thousands of Go routines. They're very low overhead. They're not a performance problem. Okay? And the whole thing about the receiver is, right, we get a result and we return. When we return, the channel doesn't go away, right? The results channel up here is still there because it's garbage collected and the other Go routines still have a pointer to it. So those Go routines and the channel are all there, but nobody can send. And the solution to that problem, I've spent way too much time on this, but the solution to it, I'm spending the time because since it's in front of you, I want to show you what the problem is and how to fix it. Even though it's not technically part of this segment, I'm really going to do this now. The solution is to buffer to avoid leaking. And what does that do? Well, here's the thing. If the channel is buffered, that means it already has a certain amount of space. Okay? And so people can store their results in the channel even if there's nobody ready to receive. Buffering sort of disconnects this thing of the sending and receiving a little bit. Right? An unbuffered channel, the sender can't send unless the receiver is ready to receive. In a buffered channel, as long as there's space in the buffer, the sender can send and the receiver will receive later. 
Okay, in this case, all the go routines will write to the buffer channel because we made enough space for them to do that. How many go routines do we start? The length of URLs. That's how many spaces are in the buffer. Okay, we'll read one item out of that buffer channel. And then all of those go routines are going to go away because they've done their thing, right? They wrote to the channel and they returned. They're not going to tick, except possibly the one that's still waiting for a result from localhost. But they're not going to tick. In fact, I don't think they'll, any of them will tick at all. And so we'll take this modified version, right? And we'll go run it. It's waiting nine seconds because I didn't take out my nine second timer at the end. Okay. But no, nobody ticked. And the reason they weren't ticking is because all of those go routines wrote to the channel and exited and they were no longer hung. Okay. There may be some background go routines running. Don't worry about that. Right. But the important part is we didn't actually, part of that is because probably the local host was still sitting there waiting for its long delayed response. But nobody was ticking. We got the first response and the other go routines all cleaned up. Okay. So I beat that to death and now I want to go back to the slides and talk about a slightly different part of this. A context is also a way to pass around values. We can attach some values to a context, say at the beginning of a query, and they're available in the various places we process that query below. And I mean below in this call tree of function calls. Okay? So we need to think a little bit about this because there's some bad things we can do with context. We can write some really bad code, for example, where we try to treat context as a big bag of things to pass along, optional parameters, or structural parts of our program. There's a good discussion on Dave Cheney's blog about, you know, a logger. Should you put the logger in the context or not? His opinion, and he's got good reasons, is that you shouldn't. But what you might want to put in the context is the trace ID that comes in. So I've got like a Google App Engine app, and every time App Engine passes me a, an, an HTTP request to process, it gives me a special header with a trace ID. And so I take that trace ID and I pass it around in the context of my program so that it can generate logs with that trace. All right? And I could use it also, I could possibly pass it along to somebody else in another header on another HTTP request if I did that, right? And so that would be part of a mechanism for global tracing, okay? And one of the reasons, and I want to go back a couple slides here real quick, so bear with me, right? Remember this tree. So every time I do a with value, it adds a node to the tree. If I start putting a lot of values in my context, then when I go to look them up, I got to walk a lot of the tree linearly to find the one that's got the value that I want. Remember, because once I create a node, it's immutable. It can't be a, a map. There's no way you can put a map on one of these contexts and have it be mutable. That wouldn't be safe. So I create another child, put a value on it, create a child. And so you don't want to do too many of those, All right? Okay. The other thing I want to bring out, and I'm going to show you an example here in a second, is we need to put a key on a variable we store in the context because it is kind of like a map. It needs a key so we can look it up. And one of the problems, if you're passing context around a big pro program, is key collision, right? Let's suppose I use a string and I say trace ID. What if there's some other library that also wants to put something in the context called trace ID? Well, whose trace ID is which? So the recommendation is to actually create a private context t key type, not a string, that's private to your package. And I'll show you that example. Okay. So here's a bit of code. And this particular example, I'm, I'm only going to do on the slides. I'm not going to try to do it on the laptop. Right. I've created a type. And again, it's not exported. It starts with a lowercase. And then I've created a key. Now, I do want to export the key. So, because I want other people to be able to look this up in other parts of the program, right? And what I'm doing here, and if you haven't seen this already, I'm adding a piece of middleware to my HTTP server, okay? Middleware in the context of Go is a function that takes a handler and returns a handler. 
And what do I do? Well, I make a handler on the fly because I'm going to return a handler func. And, you know, the most important part is the last thing it's going to do is it's going to take the parameter. So I pass in whatever the next handler is going to be. And I return a function that does something and then calls that next handler. Okay. And so it becomes a chain. We can put these things into a chain of middleware. You know, take the original route and wrap it in a middleware and wrap that in a middleware. So when we start from the top, we do middleware in the backwards order. And so somewhere along the way, as this request comes in, before I do any final work on it, it's going to go through this piece of middleware where I'm going to add something to the context, pass that context down to the next level when I call next serve HTTP. Right? And how do I do that? Well, I get the context from the request. So right here on this line, right, the, the request coming into me has some sort of context on it. Now, if this is the top, if, if I'm the first piece of middleware from Go passing me a request to my handler, then the context is probably the background context. There may not be anything on it. Okay? I'm going to go and look at the headers in the request in this case. So I do a header.get looking for my cloud trace context variable. And if it's there, and if it's not an empty string, then I'm going to do the context with value. I'm going to add it using my trace key. I'm going to add it to the context, and that context is going to be the one that I pass down. So I add it to the request, replacing the context that was there. The next level will then see my context, which has that value. And below me, in other words, any future handlers down the chain, which eventually get to the real handler that does the work once we're through the middleware, will have that. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you an example of using it. Okay. Now, this part up here is just for, you know, to help us see what was going on. Uh, you don't do those multiple places. You do them in one package. But I've got a very simplified logging function. And I, this is not real world. This is, again, very simplified. <clears throat> I'm going to have a log that uses the context. All right. So when you call this function, you don't just pass in the formatting string and the things that you want to print out. You also pass in the context. All right. And I'm going to go and look in that context and ask, does it have a trace ID by looking up the trace key? So again, think of this like a map. I'm going to go into the map with the trace key and get a value. Now, there's one other thing going on here that I'm not going to fully explain. Okay, Reflection. Because it's, it's generic, what the map is storing, and again, this is theoretically, it's not really a map, it's this chain of context nodes pointing at each other. But if you think of it like a map, what it's storing is blank interfaces, empty interfaces. And what we already talked about was, what does the empty interface say? It says nothing, right? It represents any type. So we have to downcast it or do a type conversion. And to do that, we use reflection. We're going to use runtime type information to find out what it really is. And so that's what this line is doing. It says, not only get the thing out of the map, okay, and I'm sorry, I've, I've made it hard to read here, so let me get some of that out of the way. This right here, I want to illustrate that, okay? There's this really weird thing, dot parenthesis string dot. That is an example of a downcast. We are saying, take this thing and try to make it be a string. Okay. Now, in this case, we're doing it with two return values. All right. And what does the OK mean? Well, the OK means it worked. The value is there, and it's a string. All right. If OK is false, that means it wasn't convertible to string. Okay. And that's all, I, I don't want to go further into reflection. So if we got it, if we got the value out of the context, it was there, and it's not an empty string, which it shouldn't be. We tried not to put an empty string in. Then we're going to just do this. This is really cheap. We're just going to take the formatting string and put this trace ID in front of it. And that way, when the log comes out, it's going to have the trace ID and then whatever other stuff was supposed to be formatted in the log. Right? But what we did is we did that by going into the context and looking up the trace ID from the context. So it's getting passed around the program, 
to different places which can get that value. And I think trace ID is a good example of using context. The trace ID would be one. Um, the start time, if I want to be able to calculate latency in different parts of the program, latency is how long did it take me to, from the start of the query to get here, I could pass the start time around as a context value, right? Maybe I need to pass around the API key that was passed in as part of the request. So I think that might be fair also, right? But structural parts of the program, like loggers, maybe not. And again, we probably don't want to turn the context into a giant bag of values, right? Because what we've done then is we've hidden them, right? We want things in Go to be visible as much as possible in the code, right? And so I think misusing context actually is bad. It creates bad code style because now it's carrying along all this baggage. A little bit is okay, a lot is not. Okay, so that was a short introduction to context and a long introduction to how Go routines leak, right? And again, it's just because this example came up and I couldn't resist pointing out about this. It's the exact paradigm where Go routines leak. But the context itself is very useful, again, both for providing a cancellation mechanism and a way to carry around certain variables that are related to the, pro the, the work you're doing.